voice. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest friend, but holy trust in Jesus. It's been going for many, many years. It's been going longer than I've lived, I think. 
Um, this is going to be the final one. Um, there's mission swaps, there's um, preaching, a lot of preaching. It is time for women to be together, to be with God. Um, but we don't just do that. There's fun if you don't, if you, you want to go and pray privately, you've got that. You've got crafting, you've got the Christian bookshop. There's lots and lots going on, and this is going to be the last one. And I do feel that whoever goes will be extremely blessed. So if you want to know any more information, just give me a shout later. Um, it's September 9th to the 11th of this year. Thanks a lot. But uh, good morning, good to see you, welcome. Uh, as Eric's already said, one correction to what Eric said in the notices. Who is not preaching this morning? I'm leading, Phil is preaching. All shout out hallelujah. That's <laughs> okay, that's it. Uh, I, I was talking to Phil, and I'm sure you won't mind me saying this in the course of the week, uh, saying that uh, we were sharing the service this morning, and uh, you know, uh, Phil's very sharp, he said, oh, can you look at the baby's he said, to Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid. <laughs> so, there we are. Yeah. Uh, I guess we need that Phil and Mark and his brother and I go back uh, a number of years and uh, we share some of the ministry for many years in Spain. Phil and Mark were at a Spanish uh, evangelical church there and his brother and I were at an English speaking uh, Baptist church there. I looked at the Daily Telegraph uh, weather conditions in Europe on uh, Saturday, yesterday, and would you believe? that in Valencia on Friday, it was 24 degrees and sunny. What about that? And here, it was anything but 24 degrees.
snow the sun forbear to shine but God to call me here below will be God and our Father, we thank you again for the way that we're able to come with much rejoicing into your presence this morning. We thank you, our God and our Father, for the way that you've given us a name in which to come. Lord, we come realizing that we have no merits of our own, no righteousness of our own to plead, but we come with confidence because we come in the name of and pleading the righteousness of our Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord, for the way that as we uh, have placed our faith in him. You've imputed to us his righteousness. And for the way that we stand before you this morning as a people who've been forgiven and who are able to address God with great confidence. We thank you for the way that you've taken us from the darkness of this life and brought us into the remarkable kingdom of God. And we rejoice greatly, Lord, in the relationship that we have with you knowing not only that we're forgiven, but we are reconciled to God, knowing that we're children of the living God and brothers and sisters in Christ. Thank you for the way that you've given us the Lord, uh, the um, uh, Spirit of God. And uh, Holy Spirit, we thank you for the way that you indwell us and for the way that you make the things concerning the Lord Jesus to become so real as far as we are concerned. This morning, our God and our Father once again as we worship you and praise you, we thank you too for the way that you've just invited us to come and to bring our prayers before you. And Lord, we do that. And as our children, Lord, have left now for their own lessons, we want to commit them to you. Lord, we know that they live in a difficult world as far as standing for the faith is concerned. We know, Lord, that they go to schools where more often than not, they're not encouraged concerning Christian matters. We thank you for the way that people like Sarah and Joe uh, go into schools and for the way that they're able to influence to some degree uh, the children that they speak to at assemblies. But Lord, as uh, we pray for our children, so we pray for the children here in the community of Kinmel Bay. And we ask once again that there might be that moving of the Spirit of God amongst young people that would bring them to a saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus and that they amongst their peers might be testimonies and witnesses to your saving grace. We commit our children to you this morning and we pray for Joe and Sarah. Our Father, we always uh, want to pray for other issues as well. And this morning, our Father, I guess that uh, what's going on in Eastern Europe is very much upon our hearts and we want to bring that before you in prayer. We want to pray for the situation between Russia and the Ukraine. Lord, it's very concerning as far as we're concerned, as is the implications for other countries in that region. We want to pray for peace, obviously, and that war and conflict should not break out. We pray that wise people, people and leaders, peacemakers, might mediate effectively in this situation, that they might be hurt, and the tensions and bad intentions 
might reduce, indeed disappear. We pray for Christian people in these countries that they might be kept safe and that their testimony might be heard. Lord, we would say to you this morning that we're greatly concerned, we really are. And Lord, uh, on this subject, we want to pray for one of our own. We want to pray for our sister Clarice and the pressures on her, bearing in mind that her roots are firmly embedded in the area where there is a potential conflict. And we want to pray for her, Lord, because swiftly arriving is a long-intended and planned visit to see her daughter and family in Russia. We pray for David and Clarice most earnestly, earnestly this morning, and we bring them to you. And then, Lord, we want to pray uh, for our church. We thank you for Kimmel Bay Church. And, Lord, we appreciate that we're living in exciting days as we eagerly await the arrival of Gordon and Ali, and as we come down the days to their arrival. Lord, we pray that their journey to us might be straightforward in every way. Lord, we pray that even this morning they might be very aware of the fact that we are praying for them. And then for us as a congregation here, Lord, we just want to pray. We want to pray for those who are unwell, uh, Lord, a list as long as your arm, it would seem. And Lord, we pray for those who mourn, who've recently been bereaved, Lord, and uh, we commend them to you. We pray, Lord, for members of our congregation who are weighed down by a plethora of other matters of which we have maybe no knowledge. We want to pray, Lord, that you would keep our eyes individually and collectively upon yourself. Lord, as we've talked with the children, we pray for us that it might be our testimony that we might live life day by day with our eyes firmly fixed upon the Lord Jesus, he who is the author and the perfecter of our faith. Lord, we give you our praise this morning. We're so grateful to you, Lord, that we're to be found here in the house of God. We're so grateful, O oh God, for the way that we're able to talk to you and pray, knowing that you hear us and that you answer according to your perfect purpose and will. Thank you from our hearts this morning for your love and for your mercy and your grace towards us. We pray these things in the name of the Lord Jesus, mindful that he taught his disciples when to pray, to say together the family prayer. Let's do that together now. Our Father, who art in him, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Elizabeth is going to come and read the scriptures to us. Oops, we're steamed up. <laughs> okay. We're going to read from Acts chapter 9, verses 1 to 19. <laughs> oh, sorry. Verse 10, sorry, to 19. In Damascus, there was a disciple named Ananias. The Lord called to him in a vision, Ananias? Yes, Lord, he answered. The Lord told him, 
go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. In a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias come and place his hands on him to restore his sight. Lord, Ananias answered, I have heard many reports about this man and all the harm he has done to your people in Jerusalem. And he has come here with authority from the chief priests to arrest all who call on your name. But the Lord said to Ananias, go, this man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings and to the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. Then Ananias went to the house and entered it. Placing his hands on Saul, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. I missed a line out, I'm sorry. If we go back to verse 17. Then Ananias, Ananias went to the house and entered it. Placing his hands on Saul, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here, has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with Holy Spirit. Immediately, something like scales fell from Saul's eyes and he could see again. He got up and was baptized. And after taking some food, he regained his strength. Amen. Thank you very much. God bless you. That's crazy. <laughs> yeah. Like a Welsh tag team match. I remember in the, um, good many years ago actually, I'm not quite sure what this is. Um, I remember a good many years ago um, when uh, he used to preach, and uh, Hugh also, he still does maybe, preach in a good number of the chapels around here, and I preached in one Welsh chapel, and then just at the close, uh, he who must have been the church secretary came to me and he said, this is for you. I said, oh, you know, really nice, nice gesture, you know, the travelling expenses. He says, no, no, you don't understand. This is for Hugh. <laughs> Hugh preached last week. Could you give it to him? And, you know, having said that, I'm pretty sure I did give it to you, didn't I? <laughs> it was a long time ago. You just forget I ever used that illustration. Okay, so we're looking at roadside assistance. Uh, a study that uh, Pastor Gordon uh, started last time. I remember speaking of roadside assistance. I remember we were coming home from uh, Spain. We used to work there at rehab and counseling and teaching as um, um, Hugh did pastoral work. I remember we were driving home in a Vanette, Nissan Vanette, coming through France. My, it is such a long journey driving through France. Maybe some of you have done such a long journey. Well, at one point, I don't know the exact name, but something like the transmission shaft, the sort of long bit, <laughs> mechanics isn't my expertise, snapped and we, 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 we broke down on the, on the road. And uh, my, what did we do? The middle of France and uh, je ne parle pas... I can't speak uh, French, so of course we rang up the roadside assistance. And this amazing man came and really helped us out. I remember him, he looked at the piece that we were holding up and he did a sort of a zoot alors, you know, the sort of a 
French expression of my oh my, and uh, said, never mind, he'd fix it, booked us into a hotel, a really amazing job. And I remember we were sitting, my wife and I, and I think our two sons, we were sitting there, there at the table having our evening meal and looked across, and there he was. He was having his evening meal too. You know, ça va, bonsoir. You know, it's, so we thought, well, what exactly is going on here? But you know, the next morning, the, the, the van, it was fixed. We made the journey home. We never saw that man again. And you know, sometimes I, I just believe more and more in angels, in the presence of those that help us. Do you know, I've even kept his card just to so I wasn't dreaming. There it is. Assistance toute distance. Does that sound good? Okay. So we needed, we needed roadside assistance breakdown in the car. And last Sunday, we saw how Saul the Pharisee had broken down in his life. He'd been stopped in his tracks. We saw this last week in Acts chapter 9. And he, just like we, were desperate, he was desperately in need of roadside assistance. Remember Saul? He was going to be Paul. He was destined to be the, the great leader in the church. Many of the letters we have in the Bible were written by him, the epistles. And yet here, at the beginning of chapter 9, he was persecuting the church. Meanwhile, chapter 9, verse 1 of Acts, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's our disciples. He went to the high priest, asked him for a letter to the synagogues, so that he found any there who were Christians, he could take them to prison to Jerusalem. Breathing out threats, threats, murderous intent. And then we know the story may be, he was on the way to Damascus, a blinding light, he sees the Lord Jesus, and then he got up from the ground, when he opened his eyes, he couldn't see, for three days in Damascus, he was blind and didn't eat or drink anything. He needed direction. He needed encouragement. He needed someone to stand by him. He needed a sense of belonging. You know, like many people today, maybe you have that need this morning. You need someone to stand by you. You need someone to encourage you. You need a sense of belonging, roadside assistance. Well, who would come to help Saul? What help would he need? He received tremendous help from this man, Ananias, and I just want to focus on the breakdown cover he received. We used to be with direct line. I'm not sure if we're with the green flag now. I need to check one day to make sure we paid up our dues. But let's focus on the breakdown cover that Saul received. Verse 10. In Damascus, there was a disciple called Ananias. And the Lord called to him in a vision, Ananias, yes, Lord, he answered. The Bible says that Ananias was available. The help that Saul needed was someone who was available, someone who was approachable. Ananias was a disciple. He was a follower. He was doing the work of a believer with a heart that was open. He was a follower, and he was available. He was in a Damascus a town where Saul was waiting to be uh, encouraged, waiting for the roadside assistance. Ananias was there in the right place, at the right time, and with an open heart. And these are the ones that God can use. God can use us with an open heart. I love the story of when the Lord Jesus is choosing his disciples in Matthew chapter 4. He says he's walking along the lakeside and he saw two sets of brothers, James and John, Simon Peter and Andrew, and they were mending their nets. They were about their business. They were diligent. And these were the ones with an open heart that he wanted to use in his service. David, again, King David, before he was anointed king, out in the fields, caring for his sheep, maybe practicing with his sling. I'll have imagined him practicing with his sling to scare off the animals to protect his sheep, or maybe singing with whatever instrument he would use. And it's in that position that he's called and anointed as the king of Israel. Ananias was about the Lord's business. He was a disciple. And I love the way it's a, it describes it. The Lord called to him in a vision, Ananias, yes, Lord, he answers. There's something so natural about that. Something so uh, every day, Ananias, yes, Lord, what is it you were wanting? Someone who was open to hear God, someone who was open to be used. And I wonder if that would describe us today. 
Are we open for God to use us? Do we have an open heart? Are there folk that we're shutting out of our heart, maybe, this morning? More about that later. A disciple. A disciple, a follower. Would we call ourselves a follower? A disciple of Jesus. And the lovely thing here is that God knew his name. And he called him by name. Ananias? Yes, Lord. Remember when um, I was in university, was in university in Sheffield and uh, ready to study mathematics and um, don't think any less of me because of that. Uh, doesn't say anything about my mental state, hopefully. But um, I remember the first week of university, I went there, stayed in the hall of residence with hair a little longer, quite a bit longer than I have right now. Different colour also, but we'll not, I'll get into that. Mind you, I'm very grateful to have hair, aren't I, Hugh? Yeah, and so um, in the first week of university, uh, they would have a meeting where all the clubs, all the societies would gather and uh, to attract the new students, the freshers. And I remember looking there, I was confused, I was looking, didn't profess a Christian faith at that time, really weighed down, again, maybe in need of roadside assistance. I remember passing by the desk of the Christian Union, they invited me to a barbecue on the Saturday of that week, took my name, and I, we just had a brief chat and I left and I wasn't really planning to go. On the Saturday, I remember I was walking home to the Hall of Residence and a young man approached me. He said, hi Phil, good to see you again. Are you coming along to the barbecue this evening? still remember the sensation of this young man. I didn't recognize him. Later, his name was Dave. I didn't recognize him. But the fact that this young man had remembered my name, the fact that he remembered he'd invited me, that stirred in me. Really, I guess it was almost the next step, a great step in me wanting to find out the Lord that gave him that care for just a lost student. He knew my name. And the Lord knows your name tonight. All that your name, sorry, <laughs> he knows your name this morning. Sorry, you know, used to preaching in the evening. He knows your name this morning, whatever time of the day it is. He knows your background. He knows your stre strengths. He knows your growing edges. And he loves you this morning. Wouldn't it be great if we could get quiet enough and still enough to listen to what he might be saying to us? I believe he's speaking all the time. Just be quiet in his presence to be able to say, yes, Lord. Ananias was available. Also, Ananias was really honest. The Lord gives him his mission. Quite straightforward. Go to the house of Judas on Straight Street, verse 11, and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul. He's praying in a vision. Now, uh, Ananias, I've prepared the way before you. Quite amazing, really. In a vision, this man has seen a man named Ananias. He's seen you come and place his hands on him to restore his sight. The way is prepared. He knows you're coming, just go and do what you're told. And, and really, Ananias, he's a bit doubtful, you know. He's heard about Saul. Lord, Ananias answered, verse 13, um, he's been attacking your people, you know. I just wonder if you've thought this through. I've heard many reports about this man, verse 13, and all the harm he's done to your saints. He's come here with authority to arrest all who call on your name. Now, in a sense, Ananias, this is the wrong answer. Uh -uh. God knows what he's doing, but he, he responds almost like Sergeant Wilson on, in Dad's Army. Uh, Lord, do you think that's wise? Is that a good idea? Maybe you haven't really considered all the parameters here. And Ananias focuses on the problem. And sometimes, you know, we can be too realistic that it's an excuse for disobedience. I don't really want to go. Lord, have you heard about how dangerous he is? Like Moses, remember? When the Lord calls Moses to go and set his people free. He says, well, who shall I say uh, sent me? And uh, what is his name? And how will they know? And what shall I do? And oh Lord, I don't want to go, I can't speak. Really an excuse for disobedience. But you know, that could be how Ananias was responding. But on the other hand, there's nothing wrong with a bit of honesty. Lord, you know, I've heard about this man. Let's think through all the parameters. Thinking a thing through in God's presence. Nothing wrong with that. If it's not a shield for disobedience. 
One of the verses that's always been a great help to me when seeking the Lord's guidance, when looking to see what God would have me do, is in Psalm 32. I refer to it constantly. I will instruct you. Psalm 32 and verse 8. I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will lead you with my eye upon you. It's always been a tremendous encouragement to me. God would say to you this morning, I will instruct you, I will teach you the way that you should go. I will instruct you with my eye upon you. But his guidance, it doesn't come like sort of divine, I don't know, letters in the sky, I don't know, pamphlets from heaven as far as I know. The next verse says, don't be like the horse or a mule without understanding. In other words, be prepared to think it through. Use your head. I will instruct you, but come on, think it through in my presence. Because Ananias was right to have doubts. Hey, this man, you're telling me to go and pray for him? All right, he knows I'm coming, but he's a dangerous man. It could be a trap. And it could have been. But he thinks it through in God's presence, considers it, and in the end, the Lord looks for obedience. The Lord said to Ananias, verse 15, just go. He's a chosen instrument. I will show him how much he must suffer. It's my idea. Just go. And, Anna, and Ananias, he went. Then Ananias went to the house and entered it. Not fully understanding, not knowing what the end game was, he went. Not knowing how he was going to be received, still unsure. He was a man well spoken of by the whole of the Jews in that town, Acts 22 tells us. But he just didn't know what's going to happen. How will I be received? What am I going to say? Or well, the Lord told me what I'm going to say, but I really don't know. But I'll do it. And that really is what faith does, isn't it? Faith considers the, the parameters. Maybe you're facing a decision today. Maybe you're wondering what direction your life should go. Maybe there's a difficulty you're facing and you're weighing it up. Do I do this? Do I do that? Think it through in God's presence. Be prepared to be honest. You know, Lord, I'm not really sure, but really I want in the end to do what you tell me. Faith does what God says. What we know is right. What we know in our heart is right. And your heart will tell you what's right. I just want to be faithful to that. God looks for obedience, even though the end is difficult. It's a lovely poem that says, if I remember it rightly, this is where you think I should have written it down. Never mind. Bold is the foe that advances. Snapped is my blade, O Lord. See their proud banners and lances. Spare me the stub of my sword. It's difficult. The situation is impossible. I don't know if I have the resources. I don't know what to do. I'm going. That was Ananias. Do you need that sort of courage this morning? What's holding you back? What's holding you back from taking the risk and writing that letter and offering for that job? looking for some further employment, making peace with a member of your family. What's holding you back? Lord, make my coward spirit brave. So Ananias was available. He was honest and obedient. I notice also that he was tremendously tender-hearted with Saul. Can you imagine the thoughts of Saul at this moment? He'd been fiercely persecuting the church Fiercely, murderous threats, hauling Christians out of their, 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 their houses, casting them into prison. Murderous threats. He'd seen a light, a vision of Jesus, the Jesus he was resisting. Acts chapter 9 tells us, had a profound encounter with him. He got up from the ground, he could see nothing, led him by the hand for three days. He was blind and didn't eat or drink anything. Roadside assistance. What would happen now to Saul, putting ourselves in his place? 
he'd no doubt be rejected by his previous followers. In fact, they did. Verses 23 to 24 says that after many days had gone by, Saul starts to preach. The Jews conspired against him. Let's get rid of him. <laughs> but Saul learned of their plan. Day and night they kept close watch on the city gates in order to kill him. These were the Jews, the people he used to work for, the people that he'd stood by and had encouraged him in his persecution of Christians. They were against him. And there's a lovely verse that says, in order to get out of Damascus, he had to be lowered in a basket through an opening in the wall. What would he do? What was he going to do? He'd seen the light, literally, he met Jesus on the road, but who was he? What was he to do? Blind, he couldn't see. He hadn't eaten, drunk, or drunk for drunk water for three days. He was in a strange town where not many, well, not many knew him. How could he join the church? In fact, in verse 26, it says, The church, when he came to Jerusalem, he tried to join the disciples, that they were afraid of him. They didn't believe that he was really a disciple. Man. He had enemies on one side. Enemies on the other. What would he do? Maybe you feel like that sometimes, things closing in. The news sometimes can really take away our peace of mind, can't it? I don't tend to spend a lot of time in, in, uh, listening to the news. I think, keep up to date, see what's happening. But really, do I need to know it day, day by day, every minute? It's almost as if sometimes the news media is planned to keep us in a state of anxiety and fear. Into this scene enters Ananias. Then Ananias went to the house, verse 17, and entered it. And he did two things that changed Saul's life. He put his hands on him and he said, verse 17, Brother Saul. Brother. Brother Saul. Words of tremendous acceptance. Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Words of tremendous gentleness and kindness. Brother, I'm your brother. You're my brother. We belong. He stood by him. An open heart, filled with compassion. Now imagine if Ananias had resentment in his heart. Imagine if Ananias had gone to do this task and he held unforgiveness. Imagine if he felt hatred or, or, or unbelief or resentment. Yeah, that's the word. Imagine if he really just hated, hated Saul's guts. There we go. Out it comes. How could this happen? But he had a heart that was open. If he was unforgiven, if he, if he harboured unforgiveness, could he have done this? I don't think so. He had a heart of compassion and kindness. And he said, brother Saul. And in those moments, the love of Jesus filled his heart. Scales fell from his eyes and he was filled with the Holy Spirit. You know, forgiveness is a wonderful thing. Isn't it a wonderful thing to know that you're forgiven? All is forgiven. We can go free. Do you know that experience this morning? And you think maybe at the things you've done, maybe there are things that, that still bother you. Don't be chained to the past. Jesus offers you free forgiveness. We've been singing of the Lord of life, triumphed o'er the grave. We can know him saying to us, brother, sister, and we can have the joy of forgiveness. Wonderful. Amen. Wonderful. And also, you know, how important it is for us to forgive others. Ananias had a heart of forgiveness towards Saul. Sometimes we are stuck in the past remembering some animosity or what he did to us or what his family have done to our family. No, I know as a counsellor, often there are issues that we need to talk about or need to talk through, particularly when there's been really harmful experience in the past. I realise that and we can talk through those things. But often we're stuck in the past and it's simply a memory. 
of what he said. And maybe even we've been heard to say, I can never forgive him. And we're chained to that statement. Forgiveness, you know, when we forgive others, it's more about us than about them. Somebody said forgiveness, if we're not forgiving, it's like we have a hook in our mouth and we're pulled. Every time we see that person, it yanks us and they have an effect on us. Even though it happened so long ago, or maybe it happened recently, and it pulls us. And forgiveness is where we take out the hook and say, I'm no longer, I release this issue. I'm no longer concerned about it. I might not agree with it if you forgive somebody. It doesn't mean that you necessarily, necessarily agree. It doesn't mean that you, that, you, uh, uh, that you can forget what's done. It doesn't mean that it, you can be rubbed, rubbed out of your mind. But it means that it's no longer an issue for you. You have placed it in a higher court. You have stopped being the judge, the offended one, the victim, and you have raised the matter to God's authority, to his court. Lord, will you deal with this? It's no longer of interest to me. I release the burden. I can't change him. It's no longer my concern. I choose to live free. Forgiveness. Often it's not easy. Often it's a process can begin with a decision and maybe it needs to be repeated regularly. Brother Saul. It doesn't mean that we have to, it's not the same as reconciliation, forgiving someone. It doesn't mean that we have to ever see them again. Forgiveness doesn't mean that you necessarily have to meet with them. You could forgive somebody and just create a boundary so that you never come into contact with them as far as you are concerned. But the issue is closed. You're free. I choose to live free. And then Ananias, as we finish... Well, we did finish after 12, didn't we, Hugh? We finished after 12. Great, okay. So just a few more minutes. And then Ias was just a messenger. Once his work was done, he stepped back. And you know, we don't hear from him doing anything again. Okay, in Acts 22, Saul, and then Paul, (laughs) recounts the whole story and talks about what Ananias did. It obviously had such an impression on him. And in Acts 22 and verse 8, Paul Paul actually says, he stood by me and said, brother Saul. And maybe you need that right now. You need someone to stand by you. The Lord will do that. Or maybe you need someone here, some, one of the leaders in the church, someone that brought you to stand by you and to say, brother Saul. F- faded into the background. He wasn't responsible for changing Saul. He just had to introduce him to the Lord. I often think when we pray for healing, you know, for someone to be healed, it's a bit like in Mark chapter 2, where the four friends brought their lame friend to Jesus, you remember? And they lowered him down in the house, they laid him before Jesus, and they just let him do the work. And often praying for others is just like that. We lay our friends, much like Hugh has done uh, for us all this morning, we lay the person before Jesus, and we leave them in his hands. Wonderful picture of healing prayer. Here you are, Lord. Will you deal with it in your love and your kindness? The student who approached me in Sheffield many, many years ago and called me Phil, he wasn't, that was my name, evidently, he wasn't responsible for doing anything, but that kindness, that compassion that he showed, it caused me to uh, introduce myself to the believers, and in that cell of Christian believers in the Hall of Residence, I found acceptance, just what Saul experienced here, other people, this long-haired, bearded, heavy rock fan, and maths to boot, Brother Phil. Wonderful. Okay, just one final point. It's interesting that Ananias' activity, being called, going to see Saul, praying for him, brother Saul, it was all as a result of Saul's prayer. 
Now, there was Saul praying. In fact, the Lord says that to, to uh, Ananias in verse 11. Ask for a man of Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. There was Saul praying, send someone to me. Much like me when I phoned in France for the roadside assistance. Remember? I've got this to prove it. Saul was calling for roadside assistance. I need your help. And so the Lord, okay, let's imagine this. The Lord calls Ananias to go, and it is in direct response to Saul's prayer. Now I wonder, it's not outside the bounds of our imagination, that there might be some people in Kibble Bay, in Will, Abigaili, Bottle Witham, or wider, who are saying, Lord, I need roadside assistance. Will you please send someone? Please, Lord, help me. Help me. I don't know what to do. I need to belong. I need your encouragement. Wonder, would you be open to go? Maybe that burden God's put in your heart is in response to that person's prayer. Maybe it's a neighbour, maybe it's your cousin, your auntie. Maybe it's a member of your club. And you just, do you know, I, I think I'll go and see them. I think I'll go. In the quietness of your heart as you're praying, what an amazing thought that while they are praying, the Lord is calling you to go. Yeah? Sound good? Let's just finish with a moment of silence, please. Just very brief. Okay, the seed has been sown. We've heard the message. Our heart has been open, soil, we've received it. The Lord would be speaking to us now, just before we go back into the, the our normal activities or the joyous uh, pleasure of Christian company with the tea, the coffee, the children uh, coming back. Before that happens, we want to still our hearts. What's the Lord saying to you this morning? You won't have to think far. You will know. You can know right now. Something you need to sort out. Somebody you need to include, to encourage. Maybe, maybe somebody in need of your forgiveness today. You know. Maybe it's still difficult. Okay, then have the intention to forgive. Just the intention. That's a start. Forgiveness often is a process. It's not a one-off act. But just right now, Lord, yeah, okay. I don't want that hook in my mouth. I really want to release this. I want to forgive. That's the start. That's the start. I don't want to shut anyone out of my heart. Fill me with your love right now. Just invite calm and peace into your heart right now. Invite Jesus' love fully into your life right now. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. The poet says, 10,000 flowers in spring, the moon in autumn, cool breeze in summer, the snow in winter. If our mind isn't clouded by unnecessary things, this is the best season of our life. Tamagariad vela Tostriethai velashi, Twasog pir, Twasog boid pir and maru, Maru ibranin boid ni.
That hymn was written in Welsh by a local man just from one of the towns here in North Wales. Became a pastor in Liverpool. And we're going to sing it now. But we'll sing it in English. Here is love, fast as the ocean, loving kindness as the flood. Thank you. Oh,